Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Taylor Combalusier, a mining analyst at Red Cloud Securities. Today's webinar features BlackRock Silver. The company is focused on advancing its 100% controlled Tonopah West project in Tonopah, Nevada. Earlier in 2022, the company announced a maiden mineral resource estimate for the Tonopah West project that delineated 42.6 million ounces of silver equivalent. BlackRock has been busy drilling its property to expand the strike length of known veins outside the resource area and expand silver gold mineralization. It has also been testing its Tonopah North property, which has been returning interesting lithium intercepts. Today, I have with me on the webinar, Andrew Pollard, who's the president and chief executive officer at BlackRock. The format of today's webinar will be comprised of two parts. In the first part, Andrew will provide an update on BlackRock's activities and give us an outlook on upcoming catalysts. In the second, we'll take your questions live. So please send in your questions using the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. And I'll note that you can type them in at any point throughout the presentation. To start, we'll handle the disclosures and then get into it. So for BlackRock, there may be some forward-looking statements made on this call. I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of the BlackRock corporate presentation located on the company's website. For Red Cloud Securities Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. And we note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Please see our most recent research located on our website for BlackRock specific disclosures. So with that out of the way, I'll turn it over to Andrew to update you on what you have to look forward to with the story. Awesome. Well, thanks very much, Taylor. It's good to be back here. Um, you know, a lot's changed with the story, uh, even since the last one, uh, a large presentation I did with Red Cloud um, probably four or five months ago. Um, and, you know, what, what's even better than that is the fact that, you know, as of today, um, silver is looking like it's it's going to make some traction again. Um, just this morning, it broke through $22 for the first time since June. And here I am looking at the valuations of us and a lot of other companies there. And I'm thinking we got a lot of room to run uh, based on how we we're trading last time silver is 22 bucks. So uh, without further ado, um, yeah, let's get the show on the road. Awesome. So, you know, as Taylor mentioned, we put out a resource back in May of this year. Uh, not only did, uh, you know, does it signify us moving from, you know, early exploration to advanced resource company, but what it does is it backstops the project with what is the highest grade ounces uh, of any undeveloped silver project in the entire industry right now. And um, that's significant for a few other reasons. Um, you know, another thing that's changed uh, over the recent past is uh, what Taylor mentioned. Uh, with respect to a new discovery we've made um, uh, just over the summer and, and that we've effectively confirmed in our last news release, which is we've got what looks to be a potentially very significant lithium discovery directly adjacent to our uh, gold and silver resource area down in Tonopah, Nevada. And that gives investors a very, very unique um, opportunity here because not only do we have the highest grade ounces in the ground um, of what is, in my view, the most oversold commodity in the world right now, but we've also now got exposure to something that uh, looks to have some significant potential uh, in what is, uh, well, the commodity that's breaking new records every day and looks like it's also going to keep going higher. So you've got the most oversold commodity and you've got one that's, um, you know, right at all time highs. And here we are in the best jurisdiction on the planet. Um, I think, you know, the future is very bright. Certainly going to be making some forward looking statements, um, you know, just based with uh, what we've got laid out for us down in Tonopah, um, projects like this only move forward. Um, it's something to be said, uh, being the highest grade undeveloped project in the industry right now. And it that doesn't mean that we're the highest grade mine potentially. There's plenty of mines um, that have significantly higher grades in this. But what it means is that every project that has the characterization, the grade profile that ours does his, from a historic perspective has moved forward to become a mine and get developed. That's where we're sitting right now. And, um, uh, you know, right now we're still focused on figuring out just how big that is, meaning um, we're still riding that fun side of the Lassonde curve. What hasn't been fun to ride in the last six months or so is the share price. Um, you know, what we're showing here on the stock chart, this is going back to 2019. Uh, or in mid of 2019, you'll see um, that's when the company really sort of pulled itself out of the gutter 
Um, I joined in May. I think the stock was at three cents and about a million dollar market cap. We marched forward and um, in July of 2020, that big stock chart hockey stick you see there, that was when we, we announced our, our discovery hole, which also happened to be drill hole number one at Tonopah, adding roughly $100 million to our market cap uh, overnight. Um, now, that also happened to be the last time that silver was around 29 30 bucks, And since then, we've been fighting the market ever since. So declining market, declining tides. But all along, we've been adding value by the drill bit. We are now... Um, maybe a third of the price that we were from a uh, for, from a stock price that we were when we had one drill hole in the project. Here we are about a year and a half, two years later after after drilling that hole. We're now backstopped by 43 million ounces. We've since uh, coming out with that resource, we've more than doubled the footprint of known mineralization and we're trading around 50 cents. Now, I think that's a hell of an opportunity. Um, and, you know, it's not just something that CEOs say. I mean, lots of CEOs are happy to say that they're undervalued. Um, but don't listen to what I say. Listen to what I do. Um, and that's simply because for the last few months, I thought we were overvalued. For the last few months, I've seen silver go under the cost of production for most of the silver miners out there. And I've been deploying as much capital as I've been personally able to leverage and get my hands on and buying stock in the market. In the last month or two, I've put over $200,000 of stock, and you can track that from my SETI filings into the market. So, you know, be wary of chefs that don't eat their own cooking. And in my uh, in my case, I'm at the all-you-can-eat buffet, and I'm about to tap out. So uh, it's nice to see that silver's finally catching up. Um, now, you'll see the big fall around um, May of this year. Um, that comes in, there was two big events that happened. First event was... Um, I think it was a sell the new sort of um, issue with respect to us coming out with their maiden resource. Uh, lots of people jumped in hoping to uh, make some money on that arbitrage, but it coincided with another time, uh, 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 well, a horrible time for silver. Uh, from mid-April uh, to early May, silver went on a historic losing streak. It went uh, red, something like 18 out of 19 days. It had never done that uh, in over 100 years. You're going back to Great Depression era where it had not had a losing streak that it did. And uh, from April to June, silver went from $26 down to $22. And from June to just recently, it went from 22 to 18. That's a historic losing streak. And what you'll find is that when times are good, uh, you get a lot of leverage um, uh, by owning mining stocks. Leverage on the way up, you'll significantly outperform um, the returns of just owning the commodity. But when the tides go out and silver and gold prices get hammered, the leverage works the other way too. Um, as the tides are just starting to turn right now, um, go back to where we were trading in June and look at where we were trading back then. We we're trading around 65 to 70 cent range. Um, today we're trading at the 50 cent range and we've since added significantly more blue sky potential um, based off of uh, our step out drill program, which still remains ongoing here. Uh, a few other things that I'll mention in terms of our stock chart here. You know, we've turned the corner from, you know, being a $1 million company three years ago to, you know, roughly $100 million here today. We've got strategic investment from First Majestic Silver, who came into two financings last year and are clearly looking for opportunities outside of Mexico um, in terms of uh, M&A targets. And uh, I think lots of lots of analysts have us pegged as sort of one of the prime contenders uh, once um, M&A starts coming back into focus uh, in the short term here. Um, you'll see that we've also turned over our shareholder base in a big, big way, going from retail to um, very uh, research, technically driven institutional investors. We've raised $60 million or so uh, since we hit on our first drill hole. And we'll, you know what we're showing right now is some very, very committed institutional investors who get what we're doing. Um, since we hit, uh, you know, you know, obviously there's been lots of ups and downs with silver. There's been lots of up and downs in the market, um, but everyone's faced the same issues that we have. Um, you'll see that since we picked up our asset in April of 2020, we have provided, despite this huge sell-off in the past six months or so, the third best return on investment out of 25 silver exploration, uh, um, uh, exploration and development companies. Now, I'm not really happy with a 300% gain here because there were many times over the recent past that we were more than 10x for our investors. But what I can say is that over the entire time since we've picked up our asset, we've been either the number one, number two, number three, or number four best performer in the entire industry. That means we're relevant. Um, 
being relevant, I think, is consequential because when the tides do start turning again, the money is going to come back into the quality stories first. We've got the grade, easily the highest grade project in the entire industry right now that isn't um, uh, uh, developed. Uh, we've got the jurisdiction where there's nothing like this out there in the industry. And we've got clear growth profiles. So I think that we're certainly poised for a significant revaluation once all that capital that pulled itself out over the last few months starts getting deployed again. Now, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the Tonopah Silver District, which is uh, about as famous of a, of a mining camp as you'll find out there, um, if mining camps could be famous. Now, I'm not saying this. This is a, a district that lots of geologists learn about um, in geology school when they're getting their undergrads and certainly doing master's programs. Uh, why is it? Well, it's because one at a time, um, you know, this was uh, uh, discovered in 1900, uh, ultra, ultra vein, high grade vein hosted deposits of just silver and gold. Um, when it was discovered in 1900, um, it had about 30 good years of production and, and it didn't stop producing. And we've proven that now because uh, they, they, they ran out of ore. They stopped producing because metals prices got absolutely hammered leading up to the Great Depression in the 1920s and early 30s, sent everything out of business. But in those 30 good years or so, this district produced nearly 2 million ounces of gold and 200 million ounces of silver from about 7.5 million tons of material. What that means is, well, two things, ultra high grade stuff and the metallurgy was phenomenal. These old timers left very little meat on the bones. And we've shown that that holds true to today. Now, the other thing to note, which makes us very, very unique is we're not in Peru, we're not in Bolivia or Colombia or Mexico. Uh, uh, you know, we're on private land in Nevada off a highway, um, about three hour drive from Vegas. Um, this is the ultimate jurisdiction you can be in for many reasons, not only because of rule of law, not only because of access and infrastructure, um, it's just, it, but, but also because permitting this thing will be unlike uh, permitting any other project out there. We, we're only dealing with state and county level officials with everything we do. We don't have to deal with the federal government on anything and the locals love it. Um, now, as I said, this district itself, uh, it really, it didn't peter out in the 30s. It was, it, it, it stopped producing when metals prices went from a dollar an ounce in the early 1920s of silver to around 25 to 30 cents an ounce by the early 1930s. Now, when we picked up our project, no one really believed um, the story that the old timers just shut down because of the low metals prices. You, you, you would have thought that someone over the last hundred years would have gone back in. So, you know, there was a lot of disbelief when we started going out and marketing the consolidation, the fact that we were bringing exploration back to this district for the first time in nearly 100 years. No one believed it. That's why that when we hit on that first drill hole, um, drilling something like 30 meters of a kilogram per ton silver equivalent on the first drill hole, that served as a proof of concept. And that's why the stock chart violently went up. Now, since then, in about a year and a half's worth of drilling, um, that we decided to put a ribbon on and package up in a nice little bow in the form of our maiden resource estimate, we were able to put together about 43 million ounces of, of silver equivalent um, and establish this as the highest uh, uh, grade undeveloped project in the world. Now, a few things I'll point out about this resource estimate. This only represents the two areas uh, uh, on our project where the old timers were either mining or preparing to mine and didn't get around to actually uh, extracting the ore, meaning these are just the two areas, two little surface areas uh, that they were preparing to mine and just didn't get around to pulling that ore. Now, subsequently, we've continued drilling. We've never stopped drilling since we picked the project up, and we've stepped out more than double the footprint of mineralization that was, in, that was included in this resource along the exact same structures, showing the upside is still unknown. Um, it still remains open at depth. It still remains open along strike to the northwest. But what we have now is something that backstops our valuation and it provides some pretty compelling baseline credentials for any corporate that might be looking to take us out. And certainly it makes it very, very easy for analysts um, to, um, uh, to really evaluate just what we have. Um, you know, there's a few things to look for if you're, you know, evaluating resources. Um, there's certain things that companies might try and do to, uh, make it a little opaque and add on as much sort of gristle as they can. There's no gristle on our resource. We use very, very high 
standards, very, uh, uh, very established uh, constraints in how we presented this. Um, one thing we did, which a lot of companies don't, um, but they should, is we presented our resource using diluted, uh, block diluted grades, meaning, you know, in mining, you don't mine blocks, uh, you mine veins. We've diluted, our, our model is presented with um, uh, diluted grades, meaning we've actively probably cut the average grade uh, down the, from, from a diluted perspective by about 25 to 30%. Now, what that does is instead of adding a whole bunch of gristle onto uh, the meat you're getting from the butcher, we just cut out and this is just the filet mignon. Now, we've also used very, very, very uh, rigid constraints in terms of how it's presented. Uh, we use a meter and a half minimum vein width, meaning anything below that uh, doesn't get in uh, if it doesn't meet our economics. Uh, we use, and we stop optimize the entire thing, meaning if you can not actually fit uh, mining equipment um, uh, down there, if it's not actually accessible, if it doesn't fit within mining shapes, then it's not in there. Now, a lot of companies don't do that. We did. Um, and what you'll see is that the mining methods we use, we're going back to old faithfuls here. There's no exotic methods like Rasu, where you're trying to mine micro veins. What we're doing is this whole resource is based off of two mining methods, long hole stoping and cut and fill. And we use very appropriate mining grades here. So um, when you take all of this into account, what you're seeing is that the ounces that we're showing here would be absolutely seen as bulletproof to any critical eye going through here. And the ounces that we come up with here look about as robust as any project out there right now at our stage. How do you know? Well, because anytime your diluted grade is more than double your average cutoff grade, this looks like a very, very robust, potentially extremely high margin operation. There are few companies out there right now in the silver space that uh, have uh, grades that are double uh, on a diluted basis their cutoff. In fact, I'm not aware of anyone out there. We might be the only one. So this is a project that clearly should work at very, very uh, a wide range of mining costs, whether silver's at, sorry, sorry um, uh, uh, silver and gold prices, whether silver's at 15 or 30, this is a project that should capture um, uh, 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 investors' attention moving forward. So here we are now, we've got 43 million ounces roughly, um, and we're, we're, you know, we're not just a spec story anymore, we're backstopped by high grade ounces. How are our ounces valued versus our peers? Here's a good list. So on the uh, x-axis on this graph, you'll see the average grade of all the other silver exploration development projects that we consider our peers. Um, and then on the y-axis, you'll see the ounce in the ground valuation. Now, a few things that you'll notice here. Um, the gold colored icons, the gold bubbles, those are silver gold projects specifically. The blue colored ones are polymetallics, meaning they could be lead, zinc, silver, copper, gold, there are a whole bunch. And you'll often see that there's, you know, a lot of financial engineering to, you know, often make zinc projects into silver projects, for example. What you'll find out is that the silver gold projects almost uh, without exception command the highest ounce in the ground valuations. Well, guess what? Our project in Tonopah is only silver and gold, and it's about 100 to 1 silver to gold ratio in terms of what you're finding in an in situ basis. In fact, on a metals basis in the ground, uh, from a value perspective, it's about 50-50 in terms of uh, uh, silver and gold value uh, in terms of ounces in the ground. But that actually makes us more leveraged to the price of silver than pretty much every one of our peers listed here, uh, with, with, with a few small exceptions. Um, the other thing that you'll see is that the high grade stories obviously command, tend, should, tend to command the highest premiums. Now, Silvercrest, who just um, announced commercial production last week, you'll see there the big kahuna in terms of not only grade, but ounce in the ground valuations that they're commanding. Now, uh, we share a lot of corollaries to Silvercrest. Silvercrest, obviously, is just silver and gold, as you can see. Uh, they're about 80 to 1 silver gold. We're about 100 to 1. Now, in terms of average grades, well, the average grade that Silvercrest came out with in their maiden resource estimate in 2018 was roughly exactly the same as the average grade that we came out in our in our maiden resource. They came out with something to the order of 572 grams per ton silver equivalent on an undiluted basis. We came out with roughly 450 grams diluted. Diluted, undiluted, that's roughly about the exact same grade that you'll see. Now, how are they now nearly a kilogram 
uh, per ton silver equivalent. Well, that's because the more they drill out the projects, the more they get a handle on where the high grade shoots are raking. And the more you drill into the high grade shoots, the more that ratchets up the average grade. So you're not only adding, uh, not only is the average grade of your uh, stopable areas um, ratcheting up significant as you're just targeting those high grade tons, um, but um, uh, it, it, it just shows significant growth potential. You'll add a lot of ounces from a little bit of the tons that you're drilling out there. Now, the other thing that Silvercrest shows is this is how they're trading right before they enter commercial production. What we have now is the ability to be a leveraged call option on the price of silver here. Not only are we leveraged to the market, and I'll put it this way, when, you know, in March or, yeah, in March when silver was 26 bucks, most of our peers were trading for about, um, you know, 250 to $3 an ounce silver equivalent. Here we are today. Um, when I did this chart last week, silver was around 21. And most of us and our high grade peers are trading for about $1.20, $1.30 an ounce. Small moves in the price of silver equal maximum moves um, uh, leverage uh, for in terms of how ounces in the ground are valued. So as I said earlier, you want to be, if you're looking for leverage, well, you want to be leveraged to the price of silver when tides are coming in, but you do not want to be leveraged to it uh, when the tides are going out. Luckily, it looks like um, tides are starting to come back into the industry and you'll see significant revaluation potential, even if we don't add another ounce, just by just by based off how ounces are valued right now. Now, the other way is obviously de-risk the ounces we have and move them forward to production like Silvercrest. Um, that's another way. And of course, Another way to add to make money is to add more ounces. So there's three different ways to make money here. Uh, and I'm thinking that, um, you know, those are all boxes that we're going to be checking off here in the not too distant future. But, you know, let's just go back to the one thing that's that, that we have that no one does. As you'll see, there is no other project out here uh, that has the grade profile that we do. Why is there no one in the middle between us and Silvercrest? Because all of those projects that had our grade profile are now operating mines. Um, this is something that is very, very clear. It's very laid out. And that, you know, hopefully in 10 years time, we won't be on this list. We'll be a producing mine. We'll see. So, you know, as I said, this is a, this is a proof of concept drilling. And, and why, why did it take a hundred years for people to go back in since production shut down and, and um, uh, start drilling into this and show proof beyond if any uh, a matter of doubt uh, that the old timers didn't stop mining because they ran out of ore, uh, but it was because of low metals prices. It's because this is more of a real estate consolidation than it is a mineral, uh, well, exploration uh, endeavor. Um, you'll see that, well, this is what the district looked like in 1912. All these colored uh, um, claim parcels that you see are different operating mining companies um, in 1912. And what happened was in the late 1910s and early 20s, lots of consolidation happened. Um, now all of these claims or the vast majority of them are patented claims, meaning it's private land. Uh, the government doesn't own it, people do, uh, companies do. Now, when all these projects went sort of belly up in the 1930s when metals prices tanked, um, a lot of these large claim portions uh, were picked up and effectively sat on for nearly 100 years. The missing link for the entire district was this purple claim package that you see here. And this is the holdings of a company called the uh, Tonopah, um, uh, Tonopah Extension Mining Company. Now, this company was picked up out of Chapter 11 in the 1930s and effectively held ever since by one family. We're the first group to come back in and drill this project since production shut down. And it's this purple claim package here where the vast, vast, vast majority of mineral resources uh, are included. It's the two areas where the old timers were either mining on or preparing to mine, i.e. doing development work, uh, but never got around to actually pulling out the ounces when metals prices, uh, well, when the operation shut down. Subsequently to um, uh, dropping off, and here's what the, the, the workings on the project look like. Uh, in the 1920, uh, it, well, when production shut down, uh, we've subsequently stepped out kilometers and kilometers beyond where the old timers left off. Um, just to orient you, um, this northeast portion of the property that you see with all those squiggles, those squiggles represent the different levels of the historic workings. Um, it's this northeastern portion of our project that we refer to as Victor. 
This Victor area, they mined down to about 1,880 feet. It was easily the thickest vein in the district. And where they stopped off, uh, where they were said to have stopped off mining, it was said that the vein was 24 meters thick. That's the point where we decided to uh, focus our drill hole number one. And as I said, um, that was a very simple proof of concept. Um, uh, we hit 30 meters of a kilogram per ton silver equivalent on that first drill hole. Now we've got a second uh, focal point on the project, which is now becoming, um, uh, well, showing, showing some big kahuna potential in terms of blue sky. And it's what we call DPB. This is an area where the Tonopah Extension Mining Company drifted across underground in the 1920s and were preparing to mine out. So they were, you know, th there's only one level here of historic workings and it provided a roadmap for us. Uh, of all the different veins that they came across that they could see, we're getting around to mining before that, uh, before they went bankrupt. Now, what's interesting here is the two areas that we put out for a maiden resource are really just these two localized areas. You'll see we obviously wanted to chase Victor at depth because it looked like it kept blowing out and we still haven't found the bottom of Victor. But this other area here, DPB, which we call it, you know, we only, we only drilled out the areas that they were preparing to mine. Well, I'm going to show you that we've now stepped out kilometers and kilometers and kilometers along the exact same structures that they left off on. And that's going to be significant for a few reasons I'll tell you about. Now, in about two years of drilling, uh, easily become the most active uh, silver exploration project in North America. Probably one of the uh, top three or four most active silver exploration projects globally over that time. Uh, we've done 150,000 meters of drilling since June of 2020. And, um, you know, we've hit some phenomenal grades. You know, there are companies that have put out a lot higher grades um, than us along the way. Um, but what makes Tonopah unique is the consistency of the grades throughout. So we don't need, uh, well, you know, we've hit up to 6.2 kilograms silver equivalent. And, you know, that includes 37 grams gold, you know, uh, nearly three kilograms pure silver uh, in some of our drilling. But what's really unique about our, our this entire district is just the consistency of all of our drilling. Um, so there's it's it's like butter from a consistency and grade uh, profile perspective. Um, you know we've hit ten different veins along the way, and if you lay them end to end, I mean that's kilometers and kilometers of mineralization. Should be worth noting um, that for a resource, we only really included six of the ten veins in there. That was because a lot of the veins uh, were under that one and a half meter um, cutoff. Um, doesn't mean that they're not there. Doesn't mean that one day we can't look at them either uh, using higher silver and gold prices or potentially new mining methods um, uh, that may get developed. Um, but the the six of the ten veins that we did include there, the ounces that we did, that was using a very very high threshold, and that's what we're working from. Um, the other thing uh, that's worth noting is that for all of the drilling, all of that drilling that went into the resource gave us a discovery cost of about sixty two cents per silver equivalent ounce. Now, cost is 62 cents to drill. Uh, uh, that's including everything from GNA, project holding costs, uh, and the drilling, and diesel, everything. Um, we're trading right now for $1.20, $1.30 an ounce in the ground. I'll take that trade any day. We spend, we, we get that return on investment with every meter drilled, I will take that trade, and uh, we're still drilling. So, Here's the two areas. Uh, as I said, you, you, in looking at the historic uh, uh, levels on the uh, one of the previous slides, we've got the Victor uh, area, which um, you'll see in the green polygons on the northeastern portion of the, oopsie, of the um, uh, of the uh, project, and then that central area, DPB, is that area they drifted across to in the 1920s and were preparing to mine and never got around doing it. Now, here's the best part. Now, between Victor and DPB, that included roughly about 1,200 meters of strike. Um, we've now, uh, you know, in the old days, they did no drilling on this. Um, when we got started on this, there was one drill hole in the database uh, that we had to work from, and that actually drill hole was way out here. It wasn't even in either of these two areas. Um, so the, the areas that we've included in the resource are the two areas they were preparing to mine and get around to it. Well, we've now pieced together that these two areas are actually the same vein system. So DPB and Victor are actually the same vein system. They're just offset by a large faulting structure. We're now following the same vein system, the same structure, kilometers, 1.6 kilometers. We've now hit high grades along the same uh, Denver vein and Victor vein um, uh, here, meaning 
1,200 meters gave us about 43 million ounces silver equivalent. Well, we've now got another uh, 1.6 kilometers on those same structures beyond that. And it's still open to the northwest um, along strike here. So from where our drill hole, um, uh, our large, you know, kilometer, 1.6 kilometer step out hit, we've still got another kilometer and a half or so of strike potential open all the way to the western property boundary uh, um, uh uh, of the claims here. So upside is still unknown, but we do know it's open. Uh, our RC and scout drilling in this uh, highlights that we're hitting the, the vein alteration um, every time we continue to step out. And we've got some big step outs in the lab right now. We've done another uh, 1.5 kilometer drill hole, uh, which we're using core, which is in the lab, which, you know, just keeps expanding the blue sky potential along strike. Now, We've got about three kilometers of drill defined strike so far where we've tra traced the high grade structures. Well, to put that in perspective, all of the historic production in Tonopah, those roughly 200 million ounces of silver and the two million ounces of gold, all of that production came from about 4.5 kilometers of, of, um, uh, of, of trend. So we've, we're, we've, we've got the exact same trend potential that the old timers produced all that on our side of the property. Uh, on our side of the district. We've got the district um, that historically all of the early production in Tonoba happened on the east side from big outcropping veins and then it followed westward. Um, and what we're showing is that those old timers left kilometers and kilometers of strike. And it looks to be what we can show now, roughly the same size from a strike perspective that the old timers mined in those 30 years previously. This is a big district um, and they're gonna be keep you know, it, it, it'll stay relevant and certainly uh, uh, with some new chapters to be written when they when they teach about it uh, in geology school moving forward. Now, the other thing that we have, which is very unique, is early on we found that the veins, instead of just staying east-west, um, which is what the old timers were mining historically, that they start to pivot up towards the north-northwest. So here uh, in the green here is our patented claim package. This is our Tonopah West project, but we staked uh, about 20 square kilometers of federal land, BLM land, right uh, on top uh, to the north and to the to west of our project here. And it looks like those veins are going to keep running. So to orient you, um, this is roughly where our, our, uh, our, our patented claim package ends. We've added a whole bunch of strike potential to the west here. And it looks like it's going to keep going beyond that. Uh, all the way onto the, the Denver vein, all the way onto these new Tonopah North claims. Now, in doing some other scout exploration, um, we've now got a very new dynamic, and that is that we've hit in every drill hole on this project lithium. And as we've gotten a better handle on which way this lithium going, we we did a follow up drill program up there, and it figures out we've got a good handle on where the high grade lithium plumes are striking here. And it might seem odd to you that. Um, you know, silver, gold, and lithium. This is a very, very uh, geologically active area of Nevada that we're in. Um, we're right on the precipice, right on the doorstep of the Clayton Valley, which is the center of the lithium um, mining universe in, in America right now. Um, so, you know, it's not odd that we would hit lithium. In fact, right next door to us, uh, to the West here is a company called uh, American Lithium. And they're half billion dollar market cap company. Uh, we're hitting, uh, we've got the same rock formation that they do. Uh, and it's right at surface. It's called the Seabird Formation um, uh, that their project's based on. And that's what we're hitting uh, our lithium in too. So we've got some good core layers. We've got some great grades that we're hitting. It's up to 1200 PPM lithium. Uh, to put in perspective, American lithium uses a 400 PPM cutoff. So we've got some very, very good uh, grade profiles here. And you know, what's interesting is that given how well lithium is producing, uh, is um, uh, performing these days, it's about as hot as an industry you can be in. We've had a significant amount of interest come to us uh, uh, inbound from companies wanting to take a look at the, this project. And we think that obviously we're a silver company. Obviously, we've got, you know, we're trying to drink from a fire hose in terms of what we can uh, do to move Tonopah West forward adding ounces, moving it forward through development, showing, um, uh, you know, that's that, that that's enough for any one company to handle. We think that we can get um, something that shareholders will really, really benefit from um, by finding a company that um, may want to do a deal on Tonopah North. And well, if we can spend other people's money, re retain an interest in that 
um, and retain an exposure to a really, really hot commodity uh, uh, and a really oversold commodity like silver, that's going to uh, uh, make us one of the best, uh, most unique um, investments in the entire industry. And obviously the same thing holds true um, with lithium as it does silver. Jurisdiction matters. Um, you know, we, what we do, you, you know, two thirds of, well, you've got Mexico, Peru, China is the top um, silver producers in the world right now. Obviously having a private land in Nevada is uh, hard to pass up from a lithium perspective, but, you know, same goes for lithium too. You know, Chile is a top producer of lithium right now. And uh, well, you know, I think there's lots of companies that might want to be in Nevada as well. So uh, we've got that to leverage. Now, you know, as I said, this isn't a new discovery, it's a rediscovery. And, you know, one big thing, you know, having ounces in the ground is good, but having recoverable ounces is what matters. And, um, you know, the old timers did all of that historic production from seven and a half million tons using stamp mills, meaning uh, Tonopah has got world-class silver recoveries. Uh, and we're not, you know, we were able to achieve 87% silver recoveries and 95% average gold recoveries from six different composites that we put together. This didn't require, you know, concentrates. This didn't require us having to do flotation or anything like that. This is a very straightforward district. All of that historic production was done using stamp mills, meaning all you're doing is you're crushing the rock and then you're throwing cyanide on it and that's it. Um, you know, this is a very straightforward process. This should have very positive consequences when it comes to looking at production scenarios because you don't have to go through a very messy, very um, uh, cumbersome concentrate process like most of our competitors have to do. From an ESG perspective too, I mean, this is about as good as it gets because we're looking at low impact, uh, low footprint underground mines and very, very straightforward um, uh, processing methods. So lots going for this. Um, you know, I guess, you know, to end off here, what, what do we have to look forward to? Well, we're backstopped by the highest grade ounces in the ground in the industry. We're easily uh, the best jurisdiction. Nevada's, you know, Fraser Institute says it's number three this year. It's always number one, two, three in the world of any uh, jurisdiction. But we're not just Nevada. We're on private land in Nevada. And what that means is that, you know, once again, we're not dealing with any federal involvement when it comes to permitting. Nevada even has its own EPA. So it's just straightforward, quick permitting process with state and county level officials. Um, we know the town's on side. How do we know that? Because the town is there because of the historic silver mines um, uh, uh, historically. In fact, there's two mining museums right adjacent to our project. In fact, one overlooks the Victor head frame. So for 90 years, um, well, I think the mining museum opened about 20 years ago, but you've literally got a museum right next to our project talking about the significance of a project. Um, and this is the heart of the mining universe uh, in Nevada. We're right in the dead center of the Walker Lane District. Now, the other things we have going for us is, well, we're highly leveraged to the price of silver. If silver comes back in, we're going to, you know, that leverage should work to our favor and we'll re-rate on the ounce of the ground valuations. Huge step out potential still unrealized. As I said, we've more than doubled the footprint of known strike, drill defined. We've chased those high grade shoots all the way 1.6 kilometers beyond where the resource left off and it's still open. We've got 500 meter step outs at the lab. And what we're doing right now with our drilling is we're working our way back to um, uh, look at upgrading our resource in the not too distant future as well, whenever we decide to put a pin in it. Um, in the short term, we've got uh, as of our last news release, something like 10 assays pending. That was from back in October. So we've got more assays than that now, probably 14, 15, 16 uh, assays at the lab. So we should have consistent drill results through the, well, through the end of the year, early into Q1. Um, and should we keep going pedal to the metal beyond that? Um, uh, you know, we've got the path laid out. We're adding value by the drill bit. Our discovery costs are low. Our model is predictive at this point. We know where the veins are going and we're just adding strike to the highest grade project in the industry. Uh, and last but not least, um, you know, we've clearly got something of potential uh, huge significance in this new lithium discovery um, directly adjacent to our project. It looks like something that um, many groups want. We'll see what sort of deal we might be able to get on it. And we hope that um, we might find someone that uh, will take the project forward in a meaningful way so that we can ride uh, that project's uh, revaluation as well. And, you know, uh, there's lots of projects directly adjacent to us, both American Lithium, 
Uh, or you could look at Cypress Development Corp, who's south of us, both with lithium claystone deposits, similar in grade profile and similar in potential size potential to us from a, a package point of view. Those are both trading uh, for significantly higher market caps than we are right now. And they don't have the highest grade silver ounces in the industry either to backstop themselves either. So who knows? I don't know what could be bigger at the end of the day. I know that our team are precious metal specialists. Um, and, that, you know, we're going to be focused uh, with with uh, laser precision on advancing Tonopah Westford and adding as many ounces as we can, as methodically as we can. But I think the lithium thing could come out of nowhere uh, and really add something, a, a new profile. So um, with that, maybe I'll hand it back over to Taylor and we can take some questions. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Andrew. That was a great presentation. Uh, so now we'll turn over to the Q&A portion of the webinar. And just a reminder to everybody on the line uh, that you can type your questions into the chat box at any point. Um, so having said that, we ha we do have quite a few that have come in already. So I'm just going to start here at the beginning. Um, it says here, no more encouragement than seeing management buy shares. Have any other insiders also been buying? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not... Uh... You, you know, the, the only time I'm on CD is filing my own report. So I haven't really been following. All I know is that um, I've been loading up as much as I can. And, and if I can find if I can find ways to get more, I probably will. So um, uh, but as easily you can search online um, and find it. CEO.ca has actually got a really good platform uh, for quickly looking um, who's got what. But I'm now over four million shares, quite a bit over four million shares. And, you know, I think down here is a gift um if it depends on what your outlook on silver is and gold is but all i knew is that when silver was trading for 18 or 19 bucks go look at what uh you know the large silver miners are producing it i mean there are a lot of them are producing in 1920 some are much more than that yeah, meaning no one's really making any money down there and the best price best price best cure for low prices is low prices um having a high grade project like ours you know our investment profile becomes that much more crystallize when metal prices are low because the optionality plays the ones that have no hope in hell of making any money at 19 or 20 dollar silver and 100 dollar oil and gas uh of ever moving forward ours does that means you know we're probably one of the few companies that uh targets out there with assets like ours that uh, would ever be looked at from an MA perspective um because we'll work generally at any price uh, situation that silver and gold could, could get to so um all i know is that yeah, it's, uh, I've been, I, you know, as I said, chef, don't trust a chef that doesn't eat his own cooking and I'm still hungry. Perfect. Um, another question here is First Majestic just a passive investor or do you have access to their expertise? Uh, the, one of the best things about uh, the deals that we've done with First Majestic is that uh, we haven't had any strings attached to it, meaning from an outsider's perspective looking in, we're still fair game. Uh, uh, in terms of who could uh, potentially snap, scoop us up. Now, based off a lot of interviews that Keith's done, it's clear that they're scaling up their Nevada team significantly. Um, they, you know, for 19 years, they had their motto, corporate motto, which was called One Country, One Commodity, because they had all their minds down in Mexico focused just on silver. But when they got out of uh, Mexico or, 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 or expanded their jurisdictional uh, profile to Nevada by buying, buying Jared Canyon, we were the first um, investment they made uh, uh, outside of Mexico, and they changed their motto to from one country, one commodity to two countries, two commodities. What's interesting is that um, after doing two financings in us, they also invested in Suma Silver, which has the eastern half of the district, the, the, the portion of the district where all the historic mining took place. Um, and they bought uh, that they, they cut a check into them, too. So. I don't think it takes you know too much deductive reasoning to think that Tonopah is clearly on their radar. But if we're on their radar, we're on a lot of other groups' radars too, because there's very few silver primary assets out there globally. Um, and when you look at what's going on, uh, uh, you know, in South and Central America right now, and in Mexico, I mean, there's there's a lot of issues that you're just not going to find um, uh, uh, well in Nevada that you find down there. So um, I think we're in a good position. But no, there's no. There's no strings attached, meaning there's no technical committees. There's none of that. We don't, to, you know, I guess one thing I didn't touch on in the presentation that I probably should have is that, you know, I'm here talking with you, but our technical team, um, they're, that, that I'm here talking with you so I can free up our technical team to do what they do best. The head of our technical team and the chairman of our company is Bill Howell. 
Bill Howell uh, was effectively head of exploration for Placer Dome up until they got taken out by uh, Barrick in 2005 for I think it was five or it, could, it was either five billion or ten billion dollars. Either way, you know it was they were one of the biggest precious metals um, uh, companies in the entire world. And Bill's added over a hundred million ounces of gold to reserves and through discoveries in his career. Our technical team, our consultants, our project geologists are all ex placer They've got a heck of a lot more gray hair than I do. And we've built uh, one of the best teams in Nevada um, that knows how to not only obviously make discoveries, but scale them up. So uh, we've got a big company operator in the form of Bill calling the shots at the site. Um, and, you know, I free up as much of his time uh, uh, by doing things like this. So he's focused on what he's good at and I'm here because, well, what else can I do? So. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, next question will go to here. Um, I guess I'll combine two into one. Uh, generally just focusing on the strategy for the company, uh, both uh, number one with the silver cloud asset and two with the lithium asset. Yeah, well, the lithium asset, I mean, there's a big, there's a big um, technical gap between precious metals, you know, vein hosted, drilling on vein hosted, low sulfidation, mid sulfidation, epithermal projects, and then lithium claystone. Lithium claystones are a new um, type of deposit in the sense that, you know, obviously they've been around for millions of years, but it's only in the recent past um, that these are coming back uh, while well, coming into the spotlight um, because historically there's only been the brines and then the lithium carbonate, the, the pegmatite cell deposits. Lithium clay deposits um, are coming in the spotlight now just because of um, breakthroughs in the extraction and the uh, uh, metallurgy process. We're covering it. Uh, that's not what we know anything about. So we are looking for um, uh, groups that know what they're doing. I want a specialist coming in there that's got a lot of gray hairs in the lithium industry to work the project. And if we can find a way that makes sense for shareholders, uh, and, and that could come in any form where we can ride that project revaluation as it moves forward, we'll do that. So we're open to any and all offers on that front. And there's certainly been lots of people coming to knock at our door in the past month or two since we've uh, really confirmed the discovery and then shown that we've figured out which way, uh, well, where the high grades is, are. Silver Cloud, which is which was uh, our flagship asset before we got, um, uh, but before we generated Tonopa about a year after myself and Bill joined, that's a very different proposition than we've got um, down in Tonopa. Tonopa is a brownfield asset. It's a historic district where we're literally just picking up where the old timers left off. Silver primary, it's easy to stand out. We've got a clear growth poten potential there. Um, it's a predictive model. You know, we know with every drill hole, we're not fishing around with the drill bit. It's not an expensive treasure hunt. Silver cloud is a very different proposition. It's a very interesting, compelling proposition, but it's very different. It's 45 square kilometers on what's easily the highest grade gold belt in Nevada. In fact, the two mines right next door to us, uh, when they were in operation up there, were uh, amongst the two uh, um, amongst the top ten highest grade mines in the world when they're in their heyday, um, but it's very much a grassroots endeavor. Meaning you got to get a lot, a little bit of puck luck. Uh, we do have a very, very small um, program planned up there. It's going to be uh, three or four drill holes that we will get done by the end of the year. Uh, and what we're trying to do is we've hit high grades up there, but with these vein systems, you need to figure out which way they're uh, running because it can take a lot of luck figuring out which way the veins are moving. And if you don't hit them dead on, you're, you're, you you know, it could be a very expensive endeavor. You know, we want to be cognizant uh, of the money that we have. We want to deploy that where we know we can add value with every drill hole. That's Tonopa. Uh, we certainly have this nice pivot with lithium because lithium is a hell of a commodity to have exposure to right now. We see huge development and project momentum uh, for that project without us having to spend any money on that. So, uh, we'll see what we're able to do, and hopefully it's in the you know short term or long term to get a deal done there. Um, and then on Silver Cloud, yeah, we'll see if we hit. It could really change the game because we're targeting ultra high grades up there. I mean, the the, the grades of the two projects next to us are both ounce per ton plus gold. Um, uh, so if we hit, that would change the game. But for us, I mean, it's just as uh, what we'll see. Perfect. Okay. Um... Next question, um, let's see here. Uh, go to this one, this one's uh, interesting. So um, I'll, I'll read it out here. Um, so we have Joni Eastley, uh, she's taking a seat on the Tonopah Town Board in January. Uh, she's wondering how 
uh, how can town government help and support you in your mission? That's a, I, I appreciate the question and, and it's nice to e meet you, Joni. Just the town being there in the way it is, I mean, between the, you know, mining museum, the, the, and, and just, I, I mean, everything that it's got going for them. I mean, we've had such a great um, welcome there in the, just the past two years that we've been there. I mean, we've, we do a lot to, to try and give back. We sponsor the rodeo down there. Um, I, I believe we were told that um, just through all the uh, revenue that the town's made um, from just the consultants and the contractors and our team has been down there over the last few years, uh, all of that tax revenue that came into the town uh, was able to, um, uh, to, to help pay for uh, the new sidewalks um, in the main drag there. I mean, that's really it. it, it this is, it, it's fun being there because there's lots of projects out there um, that aren't off a highway walking distance to a town. I mean, um, so getting drillers and consultants to want to work for us where they can literally roll out of bed and walk to the drill rigs is something very unique and very special. I mean, there's not a development stage project in the world right now. I don't, I mean, I'm not talking about just silver. I'm talking about precious metals um, that has the setup that we do. That Tonopah is sort of like Valdor, uh, Quebec in that sense. Um, you know, we're set up, our Victor deposit sort of right behind, um, you know, the Burger King and the Subway Sandwich Shop uh, from that regard. And I think the town, it's already been as supportive as it gets. We don't need any, you know, we don't need any help, but we'd certainly just, just the continued support is, is something that we'd obviously, and collaborative support is something that we really uh, will value moving forward. Perfect. Okay. Um, so we're getting close to uh, the hour here. Um, so maybe just, uh, you know, get, kind of go over your, your current cash balance. Where does that get you uh, going forward? And what, what does it yeah, so, so uh, you guys were very helpful in, in uh, the last raise we did. I think where we raised about $6.2, $6.3 million um, closed in September. Um, that funds all are drilling through the end of the year. You know, in the drilling that we're doing now, we did the first drilling we did uh, after the resource were these big, big step outs, which we connected on. Um, we put a pin in some of those step outs. So when we hit that one kilometer step out, which we announced in July from where the resource ended off, um, we're now working our way back with the drill rigs um, towards the resource. So we're sort of infilling that back. So um, we'll be in a position early next year to decide if we want to put a pin in it and just do a, a quick resource update there or you know, subsequent to that one kilometer step out, we've now hit another 600 kilometer step out and we've got another 500 meter step out in the lab right now. Uh, so we will have the option, you know, Q1 or Q2 to decide if we want to go back to market and keep going pedal to the metal and drill out all of um, that strike that we've sort of and lock it in. And, the, and that could be really quick. Um, it's just, you know, the time it takes to drill these things out, it's really just a function of how many rigs you get going. Um, we've got confidence in our model. So we'll see. We'll see how ounces are valued early in the new year. We'll see if it makes sense to move forward with a quick resource update or if it makes sense to just keep going, pedal to the metal, get as many rigs as we can, um, and then do a big, big resource update, you know, in the, you know, maybe summer or, or you know, Q3 of next year sort of thing. But either way, we're in a good position because we can uh, take, you know, we can go as fast or as slow as we want. And But uh, uh, where we're at, we're, we're funded well through the end of the year. Um, and, you know, it's looking like if the markets come back, then it's looking like um, we'll have a lot of options laid out for us uh, uh, when we lay out our strategy. Perfect. OK, uh, we did have one question come in, um, which I'll, I'll just uh, get your take on. Uh, what sort of companies are interested in the lithium deposit? Um, would that be like lithium, pure lithium miners, general battery metals miners, auto companies, uh, small companies, large, et cetera, et cetera? uh it's too, too early or yeah no it's it's uh I, I, we're sort of locked just given ndas and stuff but uh so far it's 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 companies with a background in lithium exploration development and extraction but beyond that i can't get into much detail right okay yep. and no silver worries. companies having a project like this that stands out for multiple reasons it's it's not only silver companies because there are but keep in mind that you know we're gold too on a, on a metals basis it's the value is about 50 50 in terms of silver and gold ounces in the ground. So lots of gold companies that wouldn't mind high grade ounces in the ground in private land in Nevada. And, you know, we're, we're short drive away from Kinross's round mountain mine, which has poured 50 million ounces of gold. Uh, the two towns South of us, um, you've got gold fields in Beatty, 
Those two towns have seen significant M&A um, uh, and consolidation from big players. You've got Anglo Gold, which consolidated uh, Beatty. You've got Centera that just came in one town over um, uh, and picking up Gemfields from Waterton for 200 million ounces. There's three towns when you drive out of Vegas towards Tonopah that you, that the highway actually stops becoming a highway and, you know, that you drive through and it's Beatty, Goldfields and Tonopah. So if Beatty and Goldfields just got consolidated, well, all roads point to Tonopah at this point. And, um, you know, we're easily the sort of uh, the most compelling um, uh, high grade story in town. So. Perfect. Okay. I think that's a, a nice way to sum everything up there. So, uh, with that, I would like to thank Andrew from BlackRock for taking the time to host this webinar today with Red Cloud Securities, and thank you to everybody on the line for tuning in with us.